Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is Season 2, Episode 3, Constructed Languages in Science Fiction. This is a topic that came up a couple of times in Season 1, especially in Episode 27 about feminist sci-fi. But I felt like I didn't have time to fully explore it then. And in fact, it was the main thing that first inspired me to come back and do a second season. So I've been eager to get back to this. Now let's get to it. Constructed languages, or conlangs, as the name implies, are fully functional languages, at least in theory, that are invented, usually by a single person, rather than evolving naturally over time. Probably the most famous one is Klingon, or at least it was before the last decade or two when they became more common. Nowadays, there are a lot of new conlangs like Navi and Dothraki that people are fairly likely to know about. Conlangs have a long history extending far outside science fiction, but I want to focus on their impact on sci-fi, for one, because it's the name of the podcast, but also because I feel like sci-fi is the thing that really stress tests the concept, at least for languages that get any kind of real widespread exposure. Sci-fi provides opportunities for languages spoken by beings with non-human psychologies or even non-human anatomy, and that leaves a lot more room for creativity and experimentation than fictional human languages or even fantasy literature for the most part. The idea of a constructed language was toyed with in ancient and medieval times, either in treatises on language itself or associated with ideas of spirituality and mysticism. St. Hildegard of Bingen in the 12th century seems to have created a mystical language called lingua ignota, of which very little survives today. However, lingua ignota appears not to have been a full language, but rather just a relex of Latin. A relex, short for relexification, is a conlang that doesn't have its own grammar, which any natural language would have, but instead just replaces words one for one in an existing language, usually English today. It's more of a way of speaking in code than a proper language. A modern example would be Dovazul in Skyrim, which not only replaces English words one for one, but even has the same rhymes. During the Enlightenment, invented languages trended away from the mystical and toward the philosophical, with thinkers as famous as Newton's rival Gottfried Leibniz attempting to build languages based on logic and encyclopedic classification. Today, this idea lives on in languages like Lojban. Later, in the 19th century, the focus of conlangs turned to the concept of an international auxiliary language, or auxlang. An auxlang is meant to be a world language that everyone from any country can learn to communicate with each other. Philosophically, this is appealing because having it be a new language means it would not be biased toward any existing language, and hopefully, it would also be easier to learn than English or French or Chinese or whatever the most popular language of the day happens to be. There have been dozens of attempts at creating a functional auxlang over the years, but by far the most successful is Esperanto, which you may well have heard of before. While it never achieved truly mainstream success, the best estimates place the number of Esperanto speakers today in the hundreds of thousands, including as many as a thousand native speakers who were taught it from the cradle. Pretty good for a language somebody made up. Unfortunately, while there have been dozens of these auxlangs created, most of them fail at their stated goals pretty blatantly. A great many of them, including Esperanto, turned out to be Eurocentric, needlessly overcomplicated, and not gender-inclusive. I recommend Jan Misely's YouTube series Conlang Critic, to learn more about the failed history of auxlangs. However, in science fiction, even when a language is well-developed, it is almost always being written as an artistic language, or artlang. Not all artlangs are fictional, some of them are just pure art, but they are what you'll mainly see in fiction. And while there were a few earlier experiments, artlangs seem to be almost exclusively a 20th and 21st century phenomenon. The earliest real effort at conlanging in science fiction actually occurs quite early in the genre. Edgar Rice Burroughs' A Princess of Mars and its sequels, beginning in 1912, features a constructed language of the Martians, Barsoomian. However, Burroughs really only presented a sketch of a language, a few hundred words and not much in the way of grammar. Barsoomian was developed in much greater detail by Paul Frummer for the 2012 film. Still, Burroughs' language wasn't just random sounds strung together, 
it was made of words that actually meant something. Now, in the 20th century, there were really just three art langs that gained widespread popularity. One was Klingon, and the other two came from J.R.R. Tolkien's Middle Earth. Tolkien was actually a linguist first and foremost. A large part of his motivation for writing Middle Earth was to give his languages a history to talk about. And he actually created over a dozen languages on some level. But by far his most developed were the two elvish languages, Quenya and Sindarin. However, at the same time, Tolkien's friend C.S. Lewis was also creating a language, which was another of the early examples of conlangs in science fiction. In Out of the Silent Planet, Lewis presents the Old Solar Language, which is the divinely inspired language of Mars, and was also supposed to be the language spoken on Earth in the Garden of Eden. And it's a major plot point in the book, as the evil Dr. Weston specifically kidnaps Elwyn Ransom, a linguist, to learn the Old Solar Language. However, even this was still more of a sketch. The idea Lewis was trying to illustrate was the differences between languages of peoples who have very different ways of thinking, not the language itself, and this is something he could do perfectly well in English. As the aliens on Mars are not fallen, Old Solar does not contain words for evil and immoral actions and patterns of thought. For example, the nearest translation of the word evil is bent, and Ransom declares that Weston's chauvinistic statement, life is greater than any system of morality, is simply untranslatable into Old Solar. But again, we don't actually need to know the language to understand that. This was the general pattern for how language was used in sci-fi for most of the 20th century, to explore the concepts of language. But before we dig into the meat of the subject, we need to take a minute to talk about a very important concept in the history of linguistics, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, also known as linguistic relativity. Technically, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis was neither formulated by Sapir nor Whorf, much less together, nor did they state it in terms of a hypothesis. It was formulated by various linguists in the early 20th century, based in part on the work of earlier thinkers. However, whatever name you call it by, an ironic notion to invoke when discussing this topic, linguistic relativity has penetrated deep into our culture, and science fiction is no exception. Linguistic relativity is formulated in a number of ways, but the general understanding is that the language you speak either limits or enables the thoughts that you are able to think. The classic example is that many languages around the world lack a word for the color blue, hence Homer's depiction in the Odyssey of wine-dark seas. The hypothesis of linguistic relativity claims that people who don't have a word for blue are not as good at telling shades of green and blue apart. Which kind of makes sense. If you've never thought in terms of blue and green being different colors, you might not have such a clear idea of what their distinguishing features are. However, the issue here is that science fiction has taken this idea and run with it to Mars and back. Even though linguistic relativity has been widely criticized since the 1960s, sci-fi still uses it all the time. Almost never by name, actually, but very frequently by implication. Some conlangs are made just for fun, but to a science fiction author, that's often not enough. An awful lot of the usage of conlangs in science fiction, up through the end of the 20th century, was steeped in the concept of linguistic relativity, and what kind of exotic results you could get from it. And perhaps the most famous and well-developed example is Newspeak. When people talk about the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis or linguistic relativity today, I suspect it's usually filtered through the concept of George Orwell's Newspeak in 1984, which is also the next major example of a conlang in science fiction. Orwell includes a lengthy appendix to 1984 in which he describes in detail the contents and principles behind Newspeak. Maybe one of the most detailed treatments of a conlang in the literature that's actually in the original work. Granted, Newspeak isn't exactly a conlang in the narrow sense. It's not even a relex of English. Rather, Newspeak is a controlled language. It's a simplified form of a language with limited words and limited definitions of those words. Normally, controlled languages are used either for technical writing, where definitions need to be clear and precise, or for easy readability for children and second language learners. However, Orwell's Oceania uses Newspeak for a more sinister purpose, to limit the ideas that can be expressed in the language 
so that only government-approved ones can be spoken. For example, Newspeak contains the word free, but it's only in the sense of not having, as in this dog is free from lice. To use it in the sense of political freedom would be gibberish in Newspeak, as meaningless as Chomsky's famous sentence, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Orwell claims that this language would make it impossible for a citizen of Oceania to rebel against the party, because even though they might be able to conceptualize the idea, they won't be able to communicate it to organize with others. A native speaker of Newspeak will literally never have heard the word free in the sense of political freedom, and so they wouldn't even know the name of what they wanted. Obviously, in natural English, we can reroute our language around gaps like this by using phrases like acting without guidance or limitation by the party. But the final version of Newspeak was meant to have fewer than a thousand words, all of them precisely defined, so it would close off as many of these avenues as possible. And it's not outside the ordinary for controlled languages to change the meanings of words, as with this unusual usage of free. One thing that's not discussed much, but is arguably true, is that scientific language is a form of controlled language, which does exactly that. After all, in scientific language, many words have very precise definitions that cannot be changed or else you'll confuse the other scientists, and that are not necessarily the same definitions that are used in colloquial speech. This is a problem that comes up in debates about evolution and creationism. One of the obstacles to these debates is that the word theory is used in colloquial speech in much the same way scientists use the word hypothesis. To scientists, a theory is an explanation well supported by evidence, while in colloquial speech, even by scientists a lot of the time, it means just an educated guess. I've written a series of blog posts about this issue if you want to know more. This kind of thing might be better explained by the concept of registers. Registers are different styles of speaking that people use in different situations. In formal situations, odds are that you use more precise grammar and pronunciation and are more careful to avoid offensive language than you are with close friends. This is a formal register. It's still English, it's not even a different dialect, but it's a noticeably different usage. In sci-fi, the obvious case may be A Clockwork Orange, where Anthony Burgess writes the entire book in NADSAT, a heavily slang-laden register of English that seems all but unintelligible at first glance. But likewise, you could also say that Newspeak seeks to create an orthodox political register of English and then eliminate all of the competition. This is just one of the nuances of defining exactly what a language is, which is a subject beyond the scope of this episode. But as I said, much like Lewis's Old Solar, most of the examples of supposed constructed languages in the latter half of the 20th century were not really developed that much as literal languages and were more just described to explore the concept of language and linguistic relativity. In some cases, the author couldn't replicate the language described faithfully, even if they wanted to. For example, Robert Heinlein's Martian in Stranger in a Strange Land. While Heinlein gives the reader a few words in Martian, the conceit of the book is that if you learn the language, you start to see reality so differently that you gain the Martian's psychic powers, something that obviously can't be done in print. This is the extreme case of linguistic relativity, where the thoughts that we can't think in human languages are ones that can actually violate the laws of physics. Or, I suppose, if we want to be rigorous, that allow us to see through the errors in our understanding of the laws of physics. This is also the approach that Ted Chang took in Story of Your Life, which became the linguistics heavy movie Arrival, in which learning the heptapod's nonlinear language allows Louise to see the future. Samuel R. Delaney takes a somewhat similar approach in his 1966 novel, Babel 17. In his book, Babel 17 is a language designed in-universe to be used as a weapon, a notion that Louise echoes in Arrival when she says that language, quote, is the first weapon drawn in a conflict, unquote. While it does still enhance the protagonist's physical abilities, the key feature of Babel 17 is that the act of learning the language changes your worldview to make you sympathetic to the enemy's side. Once again, Delaney includes more of a sketch of the language than a full constructed language, including the notable fact that it lacks the pronoun I. Delaney says that at the time he wrote the book, he was, quote, a die-hard believer in the Sapir Wharf, 
unquote. But he later came to see the flaws in the hypothesis. You have a more literal application of linguistic relativity with Ursula K. Le Guin's Pravik in The Dispossessed. Her language was specifically designed in story to facilitate the anarcho-communist mindset of Anaris, for example, by not including any words to indicate possession. I will note that some sci-fi authors have actively pushed against linguistic relativity. For example, in Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun in 1980, he presents us with the Askians. The Askians are a totalitarian society based on Maoist China, who are brainwashed so that they can only speak in quotations from government propaganda. And yet, with clever application of these quotations, the Askians can still speak freely if they want. Quote, The people of Askia were reduced to speaking only with their master's voice, but they had made of it a new tongue. And I had no doubt, after hearing the Askian, that by it he could express whatever thought he wished. Unquote. And just like I talked about natural language rerouting around Newspeak, this seems like the more plausible outcome. And of course, while I'm on this topic, I can't forget the famous episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, Darmok. In Darmok, the Enterprise is attempting to make contact with the children of Tama, an alien species whose bizarre language has foiled all attempts at translating it. Ultimately, the Tamarian captain Shanghai's Captain Picard into some kind of wilderness survival quest to try to understand each other better. Picard eventually figures out that the Tamarian language is made entirely out of historical and literary metaphors, like Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra, a story about two mythical figures coming together to fight a more powerful opponent. Picard even generates one of his own, Gilgamesh and Enkidu at Uruk. Even though the ending of the episode is ambiguous, the episode is all about overcoming these gaps in language and communication. As for the Tamarian language itself, and what sort of culture could produce it, well, that's another thing that's beyond the scope of this episode. Honestly, I could write a whole essay about Darmok, and maybe I will now. It's been low-key on my to-do list for a while. But Darmok is also part of another larger pattern. Many uses of language in science fiction explore not how language shapes thought, but instead how thought shapes language. Again, much like Lewis with Old Solar. Robert Heinlein gives us another example in his 1949 novella Gulf with Speed Talk. In Gulf, a secret society of humans with enhanced intelligence acts to protect humanity. Among the various innovations they use to further their goals is Speed Talk, an artificial language designed to communicate very fast, where every phoneme is a distinct word. Imagine if every letter of the alphabet were a distinct word, and the alphabet was several hundred letters long. This isn't theoretically impossible. The number of distinct sounds that can in principle be produced by the human voice, about a hundred basic consonants and vowels in the International Phonetic Alphabet, multiplied by different co-articulations, phonations, and tones, could easily run into the tens of thousands. Actually being able to distinguish that many sounds and being able to produce them accurately and reliably would require enhanced intelligence, though. And in fact, speaking that fast in general would require enhanced intelligence. Studies have shown that languages with simpler syllable structures like Japanese are spoken faster than more complex ones like English, so that all human languages are spoken at about the same bit rate. The whole point of speed talk is to have a much higher bit rate. However, in practice, there's one big problem with speed talk that means it probably would not work. Fidelity. Even if people with enhanced intelligence can distinguish all those sounds under ideal conditions, telling them apart in noisy environments or over phone lines would likely be impossible. Natural language has redundancies and phonotactics, rules that govern how different sounds can be combined together, and we still mishear words fairly often. With speed talk, it would be a complete no-go. Anyway, other authors did similar things, albeit typically in more minor ways. Even NADSAT could be seen as expressing a deep divide in culture. Larry Niven, who frequently depicts aliens with very different psychologies from us, played with the concept a few times. Such as the predatory Tanuk Tipun, whose word for alien translates as food that talks. In Star Tide Rising, David Brin introduces trinary, a language spoken by his genetically modified dolphins, whose psychology is also different from ours. Dolphins, for reasons that are never really explained, tend to think in threes, 
and their language is built out of three-way parallel clauses. And Mary Doria Russell's The Sparrow is very much about the challenges of translating an alien language across a large cultural gap and just how badly it can go wrong. However, by this point we've kind of gotten off topic. A lot of sci-fi plays with language, but this episode is supposed to be about constructed languages. There are a lot of examples of languages where we get a few snippets. These are often called naming languages because they're used more for names than anything else. But when it comes to well-developed and usable languages in sci-fi, up to the end of the 20th century, it really comes down to two. Suzette Elgin's Laadon from Native Tongue, and Mark Okran's Klingon from Star Trek. Two languages from about the same time, with very different design philosophies, which have, somewhat artificially on Elgin's part, become seen as foils of each other. Laadon was first in 1982. Elgin was a linguist by trade, and she ostensibly designed the language as an investigation of linguistic relativity, even though it was generally considered outmoded by then. However, I actually see it a bit differently. To me, Laadon looks like a sort of reverse Newspeak, where Newspeak was designed to make it impossible to express rebellious thoughts, Elgin believed that women already have thoughts that are difficult to express in major Western languages, so she invented a new language of her own where those thoughts can be expressed more easily. Laadon's design philosophy was to facilitate communication by women, and this was encoded in both the vocabulary and the grammar. One of the clearest aspects of this is that Laadon sentences must end with what Elgin calls the evidence particle which tells how likely the sentence is to be true. The different forms of the evidence particle cover the possibilities of observed directly, self-evident, seen in a dream, for some reason, heard from a trusted source, heard from an untrusted source, heard from a malicious source, hypothetical, and completely unknown. This is a concept known in linguistics as evidentiality, and it does occur in some natural languages, although it's usually an inflection on the verb, Encoding it as a sentence final particle is something of an odd choice. Likewise, Laadon makes a number of distinctions that most Western languages don't. Ostensibly, distinctions that women care about more than men. Instead of having a single imperative, it distinguishes a command from a request. And there are four different possessive markers denoting how a thing came to be possessed. Again, these things can be found in some natural languages, but not in widely spoken Western languages and there's a lot more of this kind of thing in the general vocabulary. But honestly, none of this really feels all that significant to me. Now, obviously, I'm not the intended audience, so I could very well be missing something. But these innovations don't feel particularly feminine to me. They may be things that would be useful to have in our language, or they may be things that we can express perfectly well in English just with a few more words, but that's it. Looking at the reference materials, I think the example that is most illustrative of what Elgin was trying to do comes from the words for love in Laadon. In Laadon, Elgin one-ups Greek by including 12 different words for love, but two of them stood out to me. The first, oham, means love for that which is holy. Of the other 11 words for love, the one that is closest to oham is sham, love for the child of one's body. I don't know if it is, but I get the feeling that this isn't a coincidence. It's not just the flexibility of the language in particular areas of thought. Most languages are pretty flexible, by necessity. It's promoting a different way of thinking that centers both femininity and motherhood in ways that most Western languages don't, that really seems to make Laadon distinct. But I freely admit that I'm not an expert on the subject. Also, a caveat. If you feel that any of this stuff is not appropriately inclusive of gender as we understand it today, need I remind you this was 1982. Laadon was progressive for its time and an impressive feat, but it doesn't necessarily hold up as well now. Now for the other side of the coin. Klingon, codified by Mark Okrand in the Klingon Dictionary in 1985, was in no way a response to Laadon. It was based solely on the success of Star Trek. In fact, Klingon is not the first, but certainly the first well-known case where a full-fledged language was developed for a work of fiction just for flavor, just because people thought it would be fun to speak the alien language from Star Trek. The first such case was Land of the Lost's Paku in 1974, and of course Tolkien was thinking the other way around. 
but Elgin regarded Klingon as something of a foil for Laodon because it was contrived as a very quote-unquote masculine language, befitting the Klingon's warrior culture. The primary design philosophy for Klingon, though, was to sound very alien in general. And in this way, it also was deliberately distancing itself from widely spoken Western languages. Klingon sentences are written backwards to English with object-verb-subject word order, the rarest word order found in human languages. For the record, Laodon is verb-subject-object, also quite different from English, but it is shared with Irish. However, the rest of Klingon's alienness doesn't really hold up. The other unusual features of the language, non-standard gender systems, polypersonal agreement, lack of articles, are only really alien if you're only familiar with Western European languages. The same goes for the alphabet. As a language for a warrior species who at the time were still the bad guys, Klingon was also designed to sound harsh and guttural. Okrand did this by including a bunch of back consonants, but most of the consonants are still pretty close to English, possibly to make it easier on the actors. And if you speak Arabic, German, or even Spanish, some of those new consonants won't sound alien at all. Also, by sheer coincidence, Klingon uses exactly the same vowels as Laodon. You can watch Jan Misli's Conlang Critic episodes on those languages to learn more. Oh, and since I've mentioned him twice, I should note that Jan Misli is not an expert and doesn't like to be called an expert, but he is really good at producing quick, easily digestible overviews of Conlangs, so that's why I recommend him. Moving into the 21st century, initially not much changed. Mark Okrand was commissioned to create a full language for Disney's Atlantis The Lost Empire, but that movie was a relative flop, so the Atlantean language never became famous. However, the entire field of conlanging changed in 2009 when James Cameron commissioned linguist Paul Frummer, the same guy who went on to do Barsoomian, to create the Navi language for Avatar. I talked about this before in episode 41 about blockbuster films. With Cameron's dedication to realism and immersive storytelling, he went all out to make Pandora feel like a real place. Not just with vistas that looked cool, but ones that were grounded in evolutionary biology. Physics not so much. Floating mountains, anyone? And he wanted an alien language that didn't just sound good, but was actually a functional language. And as you probably know, Avatar was a massive hit. The result was that Navi became a prototype for the way conlangs have been used in fiction ever since. Nowadays, it's commonplace to create a functional conlang for movies and TV shows, whether the language is relevant to the plot or not. The movie Alpha was written entirely in a fictional language. With a few exceptions like Heptapod, fictional languages these days are made much more for aesthetic reasons. The design philosophy for Navi itself was to sound reasonably exotic, but also to be reasonably learnable by the characters in story, striking a balance where Klingon just went clumsily in a wild direction. The alphabet for Navi is not that different from English, but it's used in different ways, with unusual consonant clusters like FP and SNG, while disallowing many others like PR or BL. As for grammar, few grammatical features are truly alien to human languages, but Navi does a much better job than Klingon of using some of the rarer ones. Free word order, tripartite noun cases, base 8 number system, trial number. That last one actually is alien. In Earth languages, it only occurs in pronouns. The result is something that feels different, but is straightforwardly comprehensible. Instead of getting into bizarre syntaxes like Tamarian or Heptapod that take elaborate logic to parse. That seems to be exactly what Cameron was going for, and it's what a lot of the new fictional conlangs are going for, too. It seems to be a good time to be a conlanger, and I think we can expect more interesting developments to come. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is available on all the major platforms, including New This Week. The show is now listed on Amazon Music. And more importantly, that means it's also on Audible. So if you're an audiobook fan like I am, Audible can be your one-stop shop for the podcast, too. Meanwhile, you can find my other work on YouTube at Science Meets Fiction. Be sure to check out the new video I posted there last week about the science of giant monsters. I'm also on Twitter at Sci Meets Fiction, and my own website is sciencemeetsfiction.com. Now, after all this, do I have an actual recommendation? Yes, I do, but it's not one of the ones mentioned above. 
If you want to see a really good showcase of Khan Lang's in sci-fi, I recommend the Sci-Fi Channel TV show Defiance. Defiance is about a future Earth that has been ravaged by alien technology after a war with interstellar colonists. Now, the survivors of the war, human and alien alike, are trying to build a new civilization in the town of Defiance, what was once St. Louis. As part of this world, Defiance included four conlangs for various alien species, Kastithanu, Lirathi, Indogisnen, and Kinuk Az, all created by David J. Peterson, who also did the languages for Game of Thrones. And it's a really good show all around, at least in the first two seasons. Season three went a little too Game of Thrones for my taste. Finally, the next episode will be another catch-up episode. This time I will be reviewing monster movies from the past two years. Thanks for listening.